Okay, so um, Blake, thanks for being with us. Um, this is why this talk is kind of like really interesting and important for this year. Um, this is Blair Renault. He is a uh, VR developer uh, with Iris VR and a good friend of Blake's. And this year a book came out called History of the Future that was a very familiar story to many, many people probably in this room, but no one had bothered to kind of put it down on paper. And it's not just that Blake put this story down on paper, but that he was actually kind of embedded with Palmer Lucky while the whole Facebook uh, transition was happening. And for the first couple of years, and I'll let you sort of tell this story, um, it, it was all going pretty smoothly. It was like the story <laughs> of, a, of a little whippersnapper who lived in an RV trailer. It was like something right out of Ready Player One. And then all of a sudden, the big game came on. Um, Blake, why don't you kind of tell them the story about when you started writing the book and then where that ended up? Wanted to first apologize for not being there in person. I feel very foolish and more importantly, like I'm missing out on something awesome. Uh, as as Karim knows, I don't really like traveling, and I, which maybe explains why my passport was not up to date. But I, I I don't really like going to conferences that much. But I really am such a fan of what you guys do at VRTO. So I especially feel bad that I couldn't be there. But I will try to make it up with uh, good storytelling. And, uh, and, you know, if anyone has any questions afterwards, I'm always happy to answer them and we'll make an effort, especially for anyone in VRTO. But, uh, yeah, I mean, what a crazy experience it was writing this book. As, as people might know, I had uh, written a book before this called Console Wars about the battle between Sega and Nintendo in the early 90s. And that was a story that happened 20 years ago. So the first day I started, even though the outline I had changed a great deal. I still knew what the beginning, middle, and end would be. With this book, I started in the summer of 2015. And uh, and like you were saying, this was just a rags to riches, ready player one sort of Wade Watts exciting story. Um, but I was uh, on the inside with Palmer and Brendan and the, many of the other executives as they traversed through this acquisition. And uh, the story turned out to be absolutely unlike anything that I expected and, and like they expected and, and in two ways. Uh, one, the most uh, important probably to our discussion today was that um, I, I finally got the access that I wanted in February of 2016. And so that was one month before CV1 launched, before the consumer version of Oculus Rift. And... Um, Boy, was everyone at Oculus really optimistic about how well that was going to do. <laughs> um, didn't quite happen the way that they had hoped. Um, and I think, you know, all of that year was a real big disappointment and surprise in so many different ways, which we can get into in a moment. And then obviously the other big change was that for anyone who's read that book or my work, I like to tell very character-driven stories. So it does center very much around Palmer Lucky and Brendan Areeb and Nate Mitchell and Mike Antonov, the founders of Oculus. Um, and, and, you know, Brendan and Palmer are now gone. Mike is no longer with the Oculus division. He's with Facebook. And Nate is still there. But, uh, you know, I really didn't expect them to be gone against their will in the middle of my storytelling so it wasn't what I expected, and it's certainly not what either of those guys wanted, but it did make for a good story. And more importantly, I learned a lot of stuff that I've tried to share as much as possible in the book with people like you and, and the audience there. And, uh, and you know, there was a lot of lessons learned, a lot of hard lessons from people who are really passionate about VR, um, but at least we can learn from it, and that you know, makes, makes the most of their bad situation. So let me explain um, Blair's situation, and I'll, I'll let you do that work for me. But the, the, the main thing was that Blair was in there early on. And I mean, like, he was at the Oculus Connects and the, in the Facebook um, conferences. And, and basically, you would describe to me how you would go, and there was a bunch of other indie devs who didn't really know exactly where this was all going. But why don't you tell us a little bit about the early days before it got to the point where Blake's book started? I don't think my mic works. Does it? You hear me? <laughs> no? Yeah. Good? Cool. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, what, what specifically? Like, 
I mean, I mean, I'm curious about what the culture felt like at that time. You know, you, you basically said, whoa, we have this tool now, it's available to us, I'm gonna make something with it. Um, oh, oh. I'm gonna make something with it, and um, I have no idea who's gonna buy this. Um, you know, you said that Oculus kind of discovered you early on, mm -hmm. and they wanted to kind of pick you up and, and, and put you into the spotlight, I guess. Or no, that's not to... really the case. All right. <laughs> um, I think, so, yeah, early on, I think all of the indie devs and, well, I guess all of the developers that were in there early on felt kind of like this was huge, right? Like, we were all going to be rock stars. Like, we've got this figured out and <laughs> nobody else does. And, you know, the cv one's going to come out and sell, like, millions of units. And we're all going to be rich and living on an island together, Indie Dev Island. Um, and like that, that didn't work out. Um, and I, I think like we all kind of put a little too much, um, we, we held Oculus up a little too high, uh, thinking that, you know, oh, they're, they're gonna figure this out. You know, they, they've come this far, they're gonna figure out all of the problems with VR, you know, they released this best practices guide, which now is like probably 80% garbage. Uh, but at the time, that was like our Bible, right? We're like, okay, this is it. This I remember is... thinking like, just write anything down as a guideline. Uh, 13 years old, you should be to use this stuff. Yeah, and... well, I, I think that's kind of what they did. They kind, yeah. of, they kind of glanced over the research that was available and, uh, you know, well, I, I think the, the age limit was probably just a, a legal <laughs> issue, just right. making sure they're safe. Um, but yeah, I think I think uh, we kind of felt the same way that a lot of people at Oculus probably felt that like this is it, like we're, it's going to be huge, right? Um, and yeah, it, it didn't really work out that way. But at least I'm not a security guard or a, a mascot per, part time. <laughs> um, so when you were the, the game that you first put out for commercial release for VR was called Techno Lust, mm -hmm. and. Um, you decided, to, and, and it wasn't available for the Vive for a while, it was just on Oculus for the first year, is that right? Yeah, it's still not available on the Vive. Okay, so it's an exclusive. Yeah. So let's talk about walled gardens for a second, and, and when you're an indie developer, you know, how do you decide where to develop? Do you go with the massive distribution pipeline that Facebook can give you? Um, do you go with Valve these days, when they're like kind of this like uh, a splintered ecosystem? Uh, do you go to a third party and like Pimax and maybe go for China? Um, how do you decide where you're going to develop and what you're going to develop for and you develop for everybody and what are the perks and hazards of each? Yeah, well, I, th I, I think you have to go for everybody now um, because I'm, I'm still convinced that it's the same 250,000 people that bought DK1s buying all the new VR stuff over and over again. So. But now they're spread across all of, the, well, uh, outside of like PlayStation VR. I mean, just like PC based, um, you know, like I've, I've seen analytics for Quest uh, from a lot of friends and they're showing basically that also, that all of the pre-orders that happen for Quest uh, up to this point are people who already owned a Oculus CB1. And what, are, what do those people look like? Do they just look like slash Oculus on Reddit or are they somebody else? What is like? Oh, I don't, we don't we don't see that in the yeah. analytics. You see how long they played for. I'm sure we can <laughs> ask Tipitat that question later. Yeah, maybe Tipitat would be better. <laughs> um, so yeah, you have to target everything now because uh, it's it's all spread out, right? Uh, on on PC anyway, um, and I think still on on mobile, it's it's pretty much the same people. It's it's not like everyone went out and bought a a Quest for their grandma yet. Uh, we'll see. Like, uh, hopefully that'll change. It's early you know? like it's still, Facebook yeah. really needs to start pushing ads and, and, you know, maybe a holiday season will help. Blake, let me go back to you for a second. Palmer was in town for a collision last week in Toronto, and um, just around that time, he posted out a tweet that says, I endorse the Oculus Quest. <laughs> What's going on when he says that? Well... As he also clarified, that doesn't necessarily mean he endorses the people there or the company there. But, you know, one of the more interesting things is writing the book, and it's something that 
we all know and have had to live through is that from the very beginning, the goal was the quest. The goal, you know, not specifically the quest, but the, the goal always was a standalone, affordable-ish uh, headset without a PC. And so it's sad for Palmer, especially. He feels that, you know, he's not there to, to realize Santa Cruz turned quest. Um, but as a, as a piece of technology, it is everything that he wanted. You know, if you go b back and look at his original um, website for Oculus, which I referenced in the front first chapter of the book, you know, Oculus was his tilt to change all the years of failed VR with an affordable, perfect for gaming VR headset. And this is it. And I know that it's created conflicted feelings in him, but I thought, but, you know, specifically with that tweet, he wanted to make sure that people knew that despite his baggage with Facebook and with Oculus, that that this is the headset that he wanted, and I think that a lot of us wanted, and and hopefully, it will be that thing that you can give to grandma, or that you, mostly I always think of it as that you can give people for Christmas, and they can open it up on Christmas morning. And you know, even saying that, I'm conscious of the fact that we've sort of said these things before over the past three years, um, and so maybe you know. I'm just deluding myself or we're just deluding ourselves, but I don't really think that's the case. And, and the difference that I see is something that always frustrated me when I was writing the book. Like I mentioned, I started really getting embedded with these guys a month before the release of CD1. And there was always this division within Oculus, which I don't think I did a great job in the first edition of the book of, of um, highlighting of, you know, one camp thinking that VR is ready and, and, whatever we put out is is the best that can exist at this time and we should go full force. And then another camp that was always um, more like, just hang on. You know, basically, that's more like the, the Brendan Reed camp of, uh, which I always felt like the phrase that came to mind was that perfection is the enemy of good. Um, and, and that's a long-winded way of saying that every release that I recall from the past few years prior to Quest, it always came with the strangely explicit asterisk, which you don't usually see with consumer products. You know, when I got CV1, everyone, Brendan, is telling me, you know, just, just wait for touch. And then I get touch, and then it's like, just wait until we don't need the PC. And then you get go, and then it's, well, just wait until we get six stuff. And at least now we have all of these things. So I don't feel like, you know, the definition of crazy banging my head against the wall, constantly saying, all right, now this is the time. This, this is the thing that I could get for um, my brother or for my parents and in fact yesterday which was a very frustrating day uh, but I did go up to my parents house to get my birth certificate and, and the best part of the day was demoing the quest for my father um, and, and, and I think you know we'll get more into it but the other important thing too is, is like you were talking about with Blair um, you know Blair was talking about how he and so many other indie developers that had jumped onto this train early on sort of expected Oculus to provide answers and, and expected them to be the company to um, deliver this distribution for, for content makers like him. And, and that was very explicit on their part. And, and in hindsight, sort of like a bait and switch or sort of like deceptive. You know, if you look back at the early internal Oculus documents and, and, or just even their their rhetoric in 2012 and 2013, it was that their consumer headset that was coming in 2013, and and so much of the excitement for it, and especially the ecosystem and content, was going to be created by indie developers, and and there is this sense of sort of stringing people along, and um, I don't ever think that anyone at Oculus was intentionally deceptive, but I think that they just didn't care enough about their audience, which was not even the end consumer; it was the developer with the dev kits. Um, and, and, you know, didn't really matter, didn't really, as any Indian developer knows, they no longer felt like they were the priority of Oculus by the time it became 2016, as I'm sure Blair can attest. Um, and, and I mention all that because it brings us to an interesting point where if you have been developing for the past several years, you probably feel burned to some degree. Um, but at the same time, you probably still have that spark that made you want to do this in the first place. And now we finally are getting to the point of, of sort of what Oculus promised, is that they can be the distributor um, or that VR is in a place where it can now be distributed to a widespread audience. And it's a matter of whether you can put aside that frustration and baggage and, and give it another go or get in now. 
Um, and, and I hope that the answer is that many indie developers, and especially Blair, because I love his work, will say yes, which is hard because I know how much he, you know, just knowing him, I know how much he has sacrificed and how much he's put into it. And as an artist myself, you know, the emotional toll it takes. But at the same time, we are getting to the actual time where what we wanted is happening and where we will really see if this thing will take off because at least it has the opportunity to be distributed widely. Um, so it's an exciting time, and I, and I hope that it hasn't deterred people like Blair. But Blair, you can tell me. I, I'm curious how Blair is feeling. I mean, I know that we talk casually about it, but, but you know, since we're usually talking in the moment, how, how would you reflect on the past few years and how you feel as a content creator in terms of desire to create content right now? I mean, I'm, I'm fine, but I think it's... You know, I, I talk to a lot of other indie developers. We have like a like a Discord that we all, or it was a Skype, now is a Discord because it's a year later. <laughs> is, is Skype still a thing? We're on Skype, aren't we? Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway. It's uh, Skype. Yeah. yeah. There's there's a bit of bitterness in that community because. Well, especially when things like Quest come out, and now it's like we're not even talking to people anymore. It's just like I have this thing I'm working on, I pitch it, and it just gets flat out denied. Or like I already have an app that I ported over to it, and it's just they, they, they won't take it. They're just like, you know, no, we just don't want it. But it's, it's like it's finished. Is it like a Facebook algorithm that just sort of decides? No, I'm or? sure they have somebody, like an intern, looking at, at like, just kind of going over things and, and just saying no, no, no to anything that's, like, obviously not what they want. Um, and, you know, like, a lot of indies just jumped in in the beginning and poured their heart into it or, or their wallets and realized, you know, they hit the store and make a hundred sales on a game that they've worked on for two years and so they're dead, right? They just went back to their, their day job or a, lo a lot of them actually end up working at, at like, um, uh, production companies doing, doing like B2B VR stuff. Uh, I always shouted that from the rooftops cause we ran a festival that was showcasing these people that not, they're not even making games. Like, there's not even less of a market for stuff that's just narrative. Yeah. And I would go to the companies that were distributing the stuff and say, you have to give them some money for some reason in some way. Because the main thing to remember is that these people not only figured it out with the tools that were pretty rough shot at the beginning, yeah. but they have the persistence, they have this tenacity, they have this creativity, this yeah, ingenuity. But who, 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 and if they leave, then, then the next people, um, are gonna lose all of that to right. learn from. But who do you tell that to? Like well, I tell that to none of the people at Oculus are gonna be the same people a couple right. months from now. Right. So it's like it wasn't they're, just not, Oculus, they're not gonna learn that lesson. I feel you. I mean that's the problem yeah. is that that there's always this kind of like scooping the cream off and then just you know taking it and doing whatever, yeah. seeing what sticks with this excuse that, well, you know, not everything can be successful, but we're just trying here as the distributor. Right, um, and it's a little depressing too because they'll, they'll dump a bunch of money into AAA companies like, um, I, won't, I won't name any because some of them might be here, but the, you know, the Oculus will give them like a few million dollars to do a short little experience and not look at the indies, but then the indies are the ones that are the breakout successes, right? Like a Beat Saber or, or Super Hot. Super Hot, yeah, they're small teams working on their own, not. Now they can take some money from, from Facebook because they've, they've got some name recognition. Well, and the other problem is that now that you have some successful games, the kind of cyclone starts to tighten. You know, So it's like the ones that are successful just keep getting redistributed and talked yeah. about, and any new IPs are going to have that much harder of a time that, cutting that's through That's another thing a lot of the indies are bitter about with Quest is like, why do I want this thing? I already have all these games on a superior platform. Right, and right. you have to rebuy all the games on the yeah. Quest, Well, right? not all of them, but yes, right. most of them. So, so and they, they actually yeah. jacked the price on some of them. Like, the Beat Saber is like 35 bucks Canadian for the Quest version. Right. I bought it for like 20 on the PC. I'm like, why, yeah, this am, is why am I buying this? If you don't know that, you have to buy games again. If you have it on the Rift, you have to buy it again on the Quest. And they've got like six different stores. What? What? No, they didn't. They, and they got paid to do the work by the platform. Not 
No, necessarily, definitely. I, That that there are quite a few devs out there that put in extra work, which that didn't get paid by, uh, you know, well, and they want to charge. Beat Saber right? got money from Oculus. Robo Super Hot got money from Oculus to do the port to Quest. The o Oculus offered me money to port to Quest, but it wasn't enough. But <laughs> but it, like, no, the, I don't think it is BS. Like. Uh, yeah, and, and even even if they did do a lot of work to port the quest, which I don't think something like Beat Saber w w was a lot of work, like all they have to do is make the backgrounds out and lower the poly count. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I think you're oversimplifying as I a know, developer. I, I, like okay, you're, you're shitting I, on other developers' work, and you know, no, I'm not shitting on their work. I'm saying and like the super hot guys. I mean, they put in a lot. No, I know of work they did. I know, this, right? I know, I like, know, I know the guys that yeah, did yeah. the port. They so. don't take this you know lightly. They, no, I know, but like, why would you jack the price up? And, and so they made it okay. parody to what the PlayStation release was, right. and they charged the same price as the PlayStation. Right. So you should think about it as PC early access got a discount. Okay, well, it, it, re regardless of any of this, uh, people are pissed off about it. Like, like even Superhot is getting review bombed on PC because people are mad about it. But I think that's just shitty entitlement. And honestly, like... Well, those are your customers, though, so... But, but I would say, too, it's a very small segment. Right? You think about it, if we're just selling to the same people, then we're screwed. We have to yeah. sell to a new audience and to a bigger audience right. than where we've been. Who, right? Amen Who's to that. doing that, though? Who's, sure. How do we do that? Who's? I, I think with games like Beat Saber selling at their full price and right. getting more people into the VR ecosystem, mm -hmm. right, or, or Super or any of these other games, right? Yeah. Like, I, I think the whole idea, though, is to say that there's a breadth and variety of games. So maybe Beat Saber is in your jam. Hopefully, Vacation Sim or Job Sim is. Like, maybe VR Chat is your jam, and that hopefully that gives an ecosystem where there's enough diverse people playing. Yeah. But like. It's crazy to me where devs are like, okay, we're not making any money, and it's just like, okay, another dev wants to charge for the work that they put in to make a port of the game. Like, it'd be different if it was just, hey, we take the same binary and we put it on a different distribution network. Yeah. That's bullshit. Right. Yeah. But if they actually put in dev time, they actually yeah. did QA work. But the customer doesn't care about that. The customer doesn't know any of that. But you, know, you think about this though, on every other platform, it's always been like this, right? Like, on the Switch. I buy Skyrim again on the Switch. Does it cost more on the Switch than the PC? No. It actually Switch costs less because it's expensive. many, it's like five to ten years later, right? right. But yeah, yeah. at the same time, like, y you are paying a bigger price than you would pay on the PC version of the Switch for Skyrim right now, right? Now, like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it, it's all comparative, right? right? But I would say if devs are putting in extra development work, they should be paid for it. And I don't think anyone should say, oh, hey, this is the same game. And now, well, okay, you don't, no one's forcing you to buy it. Don't buy it. No. But, I, I refunded it. But if you want it to, if you want it on the go, if you want to be able to play, you know, Beat Saber anywhere where you are, yeah, it's worth paying the thirty bucks for it. Yeah, it is like it's a turnover period too. I mean, there's there's a lot of fragmentation in the ecosystem. There's uh, the AAA versus the indies. But, you know, I've run an indie game review site for twelve years. We've watched the indies have their own economy. They have their own space, and typically on Steam. Anything over 25 bucks for an indie is like eyebrow raising, but that doesn't make the games any less valuable. Um, we just sort of assume that a AAA game will cost $60, but it's also got its own economy, which is like it's got how many thousands of people working on it, yeah. how much of a budget. Don't you think that the indies should probably be rewarded for the fact that they created something that's equally amazing, equally exciting, even though they did well, it for the, a tenth of the budget? They, they can if it's amazing, though, but like that's just in sales, right? Like you. Well, then yeah. there's the question. Any creative sales, yeah. endeavor is going to have this issue, whether you're writing a book, exactly. making yeah. painting, or whatever, right? Like, there's going to be successes and failures. There's, yeah. It's not a, I put in the work, it will succeed no matter what. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say right now, VR is the best place for any indies to see success. Like, if I look on PC or mobile right now, I don't see any kind of success similar to as many successes as I'm seeing in indie VR right now. Like, you look at a game like Blade and Sorcery. I don't know how many of you have tried this game made by one main indie dev yep. and a couple like part-time devs helping out, cleared over a million dollars in the first month on Steam. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, you know, where else is that happening? Yeah. I, I don't see that anywhere. No, else that's right. right now. I mean, like that, it does happen in mobile, but it, it's a lot less, uh, like there's more people in it, right? Your chances are way lower. Yeah, like even last time I think about a successful story in mobile, it'd be like 
yeah, flappy, flappy birds bird. yeah. or crossy roads. <laughs> yeah. That was like five to eight years ago yeah. now, Yeah, but right? I'm still seeing it in indie, normal indie games. Stardew Valley is just a guy who made a thing for five years, and it's gone completely... But what, I mean, that's crazy, though. Just a guy that did something for five years. I mean, there's a bunch of <laughs> other guys that did stuff Fair. for five years on Steam in the same store that totally yeah. fell on their face yeah, yeah. and are totally crying and you know, have these huge giz, uh, uh, game industry and Sutra articles. I think that's the crux of the question, about though, the industry. Pitat, is like, what is the thing that we need to pay attention to now to make those sales happen. Well, Beat we're, we're kind of screwed like with the with the new walled garden approach, though, right? Well, no, no, I don't think you're screwed at all. I think what it is, like, I mean, don't focus on the quest, right? Do what everyone, no, all no, the other I'm indies did. Right. Focus on Steam. Steam is where indies are. Yeah. Once you're successful on Steam, then you go to right. PlayStation, right. then you go to Quest, right? That's fair. Let's talk to Blake for yeah, a second. Hey, about hey Blake. Sorry, I totally <laughs> hijacked this. I will shut up now. No, no, this is literally the point of this show. Thank you. I appreciate your insight. Um, I, I want to ask you about Console Wars. You were in, um, you know, Console Wars was a book where we looked at the Nintendo versus Sega Console Wars and the, the subterfuge and the backstabbing and the, and the clamoring <laughs> for attention and how Sega tried to pivot every time uh, that Nintendo succeeded on something to differentiate themselves. Do you think that we're looking at a similar kind of path here between the two big guys like Valve um, and Oculus, or is this a completely different story uh, that's non pare essentially? Good question. Um, and before I answer that, I want to first um, just kind of comment on what Blair and Tippett were talking about. I almost feel like during your uh, friendly argument, we should cut to like Dr. Claw at Oculus and Facebook going like, mwah ha ha ha. Because I feel like what you guys are describing is really, it, it, it's, a, it's a platform problem and it's not, I, I don't think the developer should be blamed. And it, it will segue nicely into so console wars and Nintendo. But, but, you know, one of the things that made this book, made the history of the future more like console wars than maybe people I could was going up against Steam, that Steam has this huge install list. And early on on the book, I wanted to make it explicitly clear that, you know, even when in this meeting with uh, um, a VC, kind of want to be the Steam of VR, the valve of VR. And, and, and you know, among the many things that make Steam great, it's, it's that your library comes with you. And so if you buy content for the Rift and it's not coming with you to the Quest, I don't see that as the developer trying to make a buck. I see that as Oculus failing in what they have alleged to be the, the company that has your VR library. So I would, I, I wish that there was more pressure on them to um, deal with that, either to, to lower the prices for people who've already purchased it or to, um, you know, transfer it from one to the other, something like that. Um, but anyway, that's more of off my, my hope list. And also just wanted to, you know, may, maybe, anyway, um, getting, getting to console wars, it, it's interesting because as we're having this conversation and, and as we've been talking over the past couple months, Karim, and just me thinking a lot about um, where developers are today and specifically the indie scene, which is always has a special place in my heart, I kind of feel like if I were talking to, um, a developer, I, I would almost recommend, you know, who's trying to make it in VR or sniffing around VR, I would almost recommend them to read Console Wars even more than the history of the future because of the ethos of Console Wars and because it is just about a scrappy underdog trying to navigate a market that they don't control and find success. Um, and and getting to your question of, of is the future of VR, is it gonna be VR Wars? Is it Valve versus Oculus versus third parties? Um, I, I, I think that the answer, again, one that I hope for, I hope that it's yes. I think that that competition is what will actually cause Oculus and Valve and anyone else to do what's best for the consumer and not what's best for themselves. Um, and if you had asked me five months ago, I would have said, no, that's not what's going to happen because, you know, one of my big gripes with Valve is that as much as they have done for the community and for the industry, they were never willing to put their money where their mouth was with VR, which is why Michael Abrash and Ottman Binstock and others left Valve for Oculus. 
Um, so I was really excited to see them um, be willing to do that for for Index. And I guess it remains to be seen. Part of that will be based on how successful it is. Um, but I, I think that going forward, the the, the the you know as a developer, the thing that I would want to you know we basically talked about um, the one barrier being the the closed walled garden of of Oculus of Facebook, and and it, it, it's hard because you know I guess I see a situation similar to like working with my publisher where. You know, you wish it was this relationship where they're like talking to you every day, super excited, giving you money and doing all of this stuff. The reality is not that. And so your mentality sort of has to switch to, okay, how can I make this work the best for me and take advantage of their assets and minimize the friction points? Um, and, And what makes this situation a little bit difficult is because you have Oculus, Facebook, this walled garden as the barrier and that's not even the consumer. That's just to even get in the game. So, you know, you would almost, because you'd be facing a similar obstacle with the consumer. How can I get the consumer to just look at this, to care about it, to share it with their friends? Um, so you have these, these dual uh, friction points. Um, but I think I've gone off tangent in your question. Is there, is there well, any more kind of um, We've got... Epic kind of nudging their way in now with the Epic Store, and of course, Unreal is like the foundation for so much of the VR that's being created now. And they're, you know, kind of trolling um, Steam with their uh, their whole like equitable indie developer share, and saying, you know, we're not going to stop taking these exclusives at our better offer until you start being fairer to your devs. The other thing about Steam is that they they used to be quite curated, and eventually they said, you know what, let's uh, let, let's like give everybody a chance. And then they tried their green light program so that certain people were voted in, and then eventually they just abandoned that, and now there's just this glut of just trash um, that you have to weed through, which is good for a company like Indie Game Reviewer because we can sit there and curate it for you. But uh, there's it's funny how VR has kind of curated itself. It's not like, I mean, in the early days, it felt like there was a lot of shovelware demos and, and stuff, but it's maturing now. The content is maturing. And I want to go back to this idea over and over again that what is a great, <laughs> what is a great virtual reality experience? It sounds like such a fundament, like basic, obvious, simple, overwrought question. But I just don't feel like there is that answer. Like, you know, with an Atari, it was like Space Invaders and it was Tank Wars, and you just knew, or it was, you know, on the Intellivision, you knew like what you were in for when you wanted. Now it's like we're in the kind of the Beat Saber groove, which is, of course, an amalgamation of audio boxing and light, sab- uh, light blade trainer and these other ones that sort of synthesized. But but we can't just stop there. Um, I don't know if that's a rhetorical thing, but I think it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it, it's it's different for everybody. It's like what's a good night out, right? It's like it's different for everybody. And I don't think, yeah, I think you're gonna get a different answer from everybody and a big argument. I actually, had a, uh, something I wanted to ask Blake, like you, what, in, in the course of writing. History of the Future, you had access to like Facebook, Oculus, and uh, all their kind of internal workings. Did you, were there a lot of discussions about platform? And like, um, like a, a, a big thing a lot of the indies talk about behind the scenes is that it's kind of BS that Oculus charges the same 30% distribution fee that a larger platform would charge, you know, like on Steam. Uh, that that's normal, and for like a film, that's normal. It's I, I don't know what it's like for a book publisher. It's probably the same, uh, but like we we always talk about how it would make sense for them to kind of subsidize indies early on, um, because like we're all working for free anyway to make software for your platform. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if if like if you saw any of this stuff being talked about. Because like net now with uh, with Quest, it's even beyond that. Where it's like, 
it's, it's the opposite of Steam, right? Where I can just like throw something at the wall and if it's awesome, then it gets picked up and does well. But now I, I, I can't even get, uh, well, I, I probably can, but some, some people can't get onto the store in the first place to find out if it's the breakout title, right? Um, yeah, I think like the, the really valuable thing that it, it, we're curious about, what was the culture like inside of Facebook? What was, what, what's like the behind the scenes view that you really had um, maybe that's not in your book that had to do with their Oculus strategy, their VR strategy. No, it, it is in the book. And to me, um, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, I think their favorite parts are the early days because it brings back these really fond memories or maybe the parts that gets most coverage is about Palmer Lucky's exit and politics and the state of Facebook in terms of are they a big boogeyman and what does that mean? But to me, the most important chapter in the book that's central to our conversation now and really just, I think, is important for the future of VR and, and what it means for, for Facebook and not just to be involved is, is the chapter or the chapters about the platform and whether they were going to be open or closed and whether they were going to lock it down or not. I think it was, you know, chapter 39, it was talking all about all this. And, and it's important in so many ways. Um, one is that um, it, it's the most indicative of how Oculus's vision and messaging had changed. And I think that, um, you know, it, it, it kind of, there was a reason why Brendan and Palmer were the two main characters for the book. And it wasn't just because they were the founders of the company. It was because they have really different perspectives. I almost... You know, imagine Palmer like in Tron, like, you know, being the voice of the user. Like, Palmer, whatever you think about him, and there's a lot to like and a lot to dislike and a lot to criticize and all that, but he, he was always approaching it from the perspective of he was a PC user and a PC gamer and what will be doing right by that audience and also being doing right by the developer audience. Whereas Brendan, as the CEO, understandably, was wondering, how can we make a business out of this? And that really manifested itself in, in, in problematic ways, in part just because of mixed messaging. And then also in that, that chapter, one of my favorite lines is um, Palmer is talking about, talking with his friends about the solution that Oculus is going to try, um, you know, with unknown sources and how you can sideload content in so that it's, you know, it's a walled garden, but it's not really. Um, and Alex Howland, who's an early employee of the company, she says, um, something to the effect of that it's shocking that Mark Zuckerberg doesn't understand the market that he just bought himself into. And I think that is really true over and over with so many of the decisions that Facebook made. For example, even just what we were talking about earlier about um, having to rebuy Beat Saber. Like, I, I, I kind of feel like Facebook has the money to make that not a problem. And if you actually just sat them down and talked to them, they probably would get it and, and be willing to throw money at the problem to keep us happy but they just don't even think along those terms. Um, and and I, I think that, um, that that it does remind me a lot of the Nintendo strategy of the, the first, you know, sort of a lockdown, um, thinking that they're saving the industry by being so curated and so selective and so closed, but in reality, they're really pushing a lot of the people away. But anyway, getting back to, to more of... Uh, of what was going on behind the scenes and, and Palmer and Brendan and sort of using them as personifications for these two different visions within Oculus. Um, you know, one of my regrets and that I would hope to rectify in a later edition is that early on um, there's a scene or there's a moment in the history of Oculus where Brendan and Palmer are meeting for the first time. They're talking about, um, you know, what, could, what Oculus can be. And Brendan deserves an incredible amount of credit for helping expand Palmer's vision beyond a DIY Kickstarter, which I wouldn't have been able to buy a DK1 or whatever it was because I wouldn't have known how to put it together. And Brendan really had this think big attitude. But his thinking big was very much tied and parallel to the, the smartphone, the mobile revolution. And I think, and, and it was not an accident that I opened the book with Mark talking to the team on the day that he acquired them and making a very direct comparison to the mobile industry and how ubiquitous mobile phones have become. And I think all this is tying it back to our conversation, very relevant because one, you know, it hasn't caught on in that way. And, and, and I don't think it's going to. And two, the part that I wanted to include was Palmer initially pushed back on Brendan, not, not against his idea of thinking bigger and getting the game engine, uh, you know, game engines to incorporate VR, which was critical, uh, you know, Unreal and Unity, 
But Palmer um, always saw the growth of VR and the path to making it actually work and here to stay is much more similar to the PC revolution than the smartphone revolution. And, you know, that, that was 40 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, and, and, you know, the, the example I always think of is that, you know, we talk about Apple as like the darling of the PC revolution in the late 70s, and they were and they deserved it, but my family didn't own a PC until 1995, and I think that's true of a lot of people. It didn't really become mainstream until 15 years later. I don't think that's going to be the case with VR or with AR, but I do think now, actually tying this back to our conversation, is that what I heard so much talking to so many different people was this, this quest, that, you know, uh, this search for the killer app. Um, you know, whether, like you said, whether it was, uh, I guess you didn't say like Super Mario Brothers on Nintendo or, or Angry Birds on smartphones or whatever, you know, that was Battle Tank, the, the game on Atari. Um, but, but they, don't, they always talked about it like it was the singular thing and, and, or at least the camp that is more in control now and that is at, you know, more Facebook heavy talk about that way, whereas Palmer still supports arm where it's an organic growth like a PC. And I, and I think that parallel is important because, and it gets to a little bit of what Blair was saying earlier, just in terms of what the killer app is or what's the thing that's going to keep you, um, give you a high attach rate for, to your VR headset, is that I think it's not going to be one thing. I think that, um, that it, it is going to be much more like the PC, you know, what actually um, made personal computers ubiquitous and mainstream. Um, it wasn't a great game as fun as Free Cell was or Minesweeper was, but it was sort of these little things that, that made it, um, you know, and, and processing and pornography maybe and Oregon Trail, of course, because Oregon Trail is the best. Um, you know, it was, it was like, a, it was, a, you know, a whole suite, a whole kitchen of all these different things that you can do. And, and I think that that is actually, um, to me, I find that more inspiring as, as for content creators. Um, because it's not an all or nothing proposition. It also shows that, you know, over time, things that might not have even been recognized at first, there's still a chance for them to be discovered. Um, but, but that was a really big part of the discussion that I heard behind the scenes of Oculus. It was always talking about open versus closed. And, and as the book even, you know, tries to highlight, those words have different nuanced definitions. You know, Carmack sees it one way, Abrash sees it another way, Nate Mitchell sees it another way. But, but I did get the sense and, and I held my tongue at the time because I felt like I was the journalist that wasn't my place to weigh in. But it did really remind, uh, there was an email chain from, from May 2016 around the time when there was the, the DRM controversy with Oculus, um, which people were, in my opinion, rightfully upset about. But, you know, Nate, Nate Mitchell is talking about um, how Oculus, how the Rift was basically a closed system like a console. You know, he compared it to a console and basically said it was a walled garden. And then you had people like John and Palmer um, talking about the importance of keep keeping Oculus open to attract consumers and to attract developers and because it was early days. And, and what I found really interesting was sort of the cognitive dissonance of how it, they both looked at each other and felt like we're saying the same thing and not how to move on. But when they weren't, and and uh, that, that to me was maybe even more troubling that not, I guess it's, it's understandable that a company would have strong internal differing visions, but they just never dealt with it was really the issue. Um, and so they ended up going with the path of least resistance. And I think that still continues to go to happen to this day. You know, I, I don't have the expertise or really the sources or haven't done the interviews to talk about, you know, the release of Quest and what was going on. But I think that as with like the end of console wars where Sega still around, but you can kind of figure out from what's described why what happens next happens. I think it's a similar thing here. I think it is indicative of the culture at Facebook um, that doesn't know about the PC community that much, or, or you know, the PC gamer community doesn't really care, and and it, and is just really hearing their own sound, their their own voices, and nodding along to it. Um, Palmer recently also tweeted. Uh, I wasn't exactly sure what his characterization of Zuck was, but he was like, but if there's any one guy who is the VR guy, it's, it's Zuckerberg. Um, what do you think is going on in that He called him statement? the number one VR boy. The number one <laughs> VR boy, he called him. What, what do you think about that? Um, and Mark Zuckerberg being the future, uh, the torchbearer for VR. Um, I mean, well, 
Palmer has a little bit of a snarky streak in him. But I actually think he was mostly being serious. I think that, um, you know, I still do speak to Palmer quite frequently and uh, usually not too explicitly. We often talk more about what, what, what his, his new company is doing. But, but he sort of has a very um, conflicted opinion about Oculus going forward. Uh, you know, he does see it as his baby. He always did. That's why he was willing to forego a salary to stay there. Um, and, and, you know, obviously it's not as dramatic as, as the real-life human example, but seeing your baby raised by someone else is, is very tough. You, you don't want, you know, you don't want that new parent to kill the kid just because it'll prove, ha-ha, I was a better parent. But at the same time, it's very weird to see someone else there and very weird to even celebrate their success. Um, I think that also, um, you know, it, 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 it like... It does also just hit on the, the you know, way that I feel, and I think a lot of people feel, which is that I don't trust Facebook. I especially don't trust them after my experiences reporting on this book. So I would have a very low opinion of them, but at the same time, I love VR more than almost anything, and they are the company that is keeping the industry largely afloat and have put, the, you know, or whether you agree with that or not, they've put more money into it than anybody else, and so I admire and respect that. So... I think it's a really tough position, and and what I hope, you know, the the net result is is that that we are able to sort of use Facebook for their resources and getting VR out there, and then that we can move on to it, you know, actually sustaining this thing and and finding a you know stronger uh, whether it's the Epic Store or Steam, you know, basically. I, I, I am hoping that they don't win the VR wars in the end or, or, you know, basically just trying to take advantage of what they have. But but I think um, a long-winded way, again, of saying that I think, you know, Palmer, conflicted as he is, he, he is sort of correct. Mark is the guy at the forefront of pushing the VR revolution forward by virtue of his money, less so than I would say his vision. Um, and that's really tough because, you know, Palmer knows what it's like to be the face of an industry and the face of of a company, um, and 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 seeing Mark sort of make snarky comments about the privacy issues at Facebook is probably not what you want to hear from a guy who's selling you a headset that has multiple cameras all over it. Um, yeah, thanks for that insight, um, Blair. We've got about a minute left. Do you have anything you want to? add to this at this moment? No. Okay. <laughs> Blake, um, I'm going to do a 10-minute Q&A here, so I'm going to see if anybody in the audience has any pressing questions for you. Do you uh, sure. raise your hand if you want to ask Blake Harris or Blair Renault any questions right now? Somebody. Tipitat? This is coming from uh, Tipitat in the front row. Hey, Blake. Uh, yeah. Really enjoyed the book. I thought it was excellent reading, not just for anyone interested in VR and AR, but also for just entrepreneurship in general. Uh, but yeah, I think the one thing that I think a lot of people have called you out on, and if you've responded, was the fact that Valve is such a huge player in this, and they kind of are kind of footnoted or side noted, and it was because you didn't have access to a lot of people at Valve that were part of it. But Valve has had big layoffs in the past couple months in terms of key people in the VR story. And I'm wondering if, if you've considered reaching out to those people to either do an addendum or to actually even just do a, even a separate story about what was going on with Valve. That's a really good question. And um, thanks, Tim, for that. Um, I, I, there, there's a lot of things that I want to do for the second edition of the book, the paperback, which will be coming out in November, um, including actually uh, some more stuff about you and, and your, I wanted to talk about your, your original Matrix demo and stuff that you've been doing with the fund. So I'm going to be talking to you uh, also in the near future to get that included. But, okay, so, so there's a, a few parts to this. One is that um, the book um, absolutely um, focuses on Oculus way more so than Valve. Or, you know, or, or basically, I would agree, Valve does, is not properly represented um, uh, committed to, to the credit that they deserve or to their involvement in the early days. Um, that, you know, and one of the things I thought with my publisher about was I wanted to make sure the original subtitle of the book was something about the makers and misfits who cracked the code of VR. And I said, 
No, this is a story about one company, and there's a lot of people who did this stuff, so that would be uh, an instance here st- title. Um, but but what I did have, fortunately, was um, because I had access to people like Michael Abrash and Ottman at, at, at Oculus, who had been at Valve during the majority of the, you know, I guess like the first two thirds of the book, um, and also to ex employees, I at least did feel like I had the insights into uh, what was going on at the time. So I think that part of my choice was more narrative based than because I didn't have the information at the time. That said, I think that what Valve pulled off with HTC after the acquisition, after the face acquisition, incredible. And that's something I really want to dig more into. And I will be reaching out. I have already started reaching out to some people to try to get more of that story. Um, and and so um, I, I guess the short answer is that you, I think you'll be happy with what I'm able to include going forward. I also will take your help if you are able to, you know, give me suggestions about what you think I should be focusing on or could include. Um, I think part of it too, and this is uh this is, you know, this is, a, I think, a failure on, on my part. Um, like, I, uh, my first book came out, Council Wars, and it did very well, and I was super happy with the reaction, but there was some criticism to it, um, and, and I read that criticism, and I've, I'm glad that I did, and, I, you know, most of what people, um, the, the, the main criticism for the book, if there was criticism, was about the, the narrative style. And so I remember when I initially started this book, I thought, oh, no, I'm going to write this a lot more encyclopedic. I'm going to, you know, not get that criticism. And then I came to believe that doing so would be um, an insult to the people who I was writing about, that it wouldn't properly convey the spirit and the energy, and it would also be unfair to readers. And so I basically realized that that was me, uh, you know, trying to protect my own uh, insecurities as opposed to doing what was right for the book. And, And I say that because I think that, I was I made a mistake here of being partly influenced by <laughs> what I would say was uh, unwarranted because it was unknown criticism, um, particularly by by Chet at Valve. But um, there had been early suggestions that they thought my book was going to be like VR wars, like kind of like console wars, but with Oculus and Valve. And because I felt like that was such a that was not much of what the story was, I think that I. Um, did, you know, tried to compensate by not getting into that enough. Um, you know, like I felt like I was going to be some sort of like a war profiteer from where there wasn't too big of a war. But now we see that this corporate battle is is continuing, and it, it and and that really is at the bottom of all these discussions that we've had today. Um, with going forward with Valve and with Oculus, and their two different philosophies. So that is something that I think I should have done a better job on, and my reason for not doing a better job was was not good because uh, you know I always try to make my decisions first and foremost with what's best for the book. Um, but in, in at the time, I, I, I think that I that was uh, I made that a blind spot where I shouldn't have. I have time for one last question or one last comment. Anybody? Tom. Tom, the cameraman who was also a uh, adept. VR producer has got a question for you. And we're giving a talk on Monday, so be sure to be there. <laughs> uh, I have a question for both Blair and Blake, and I guess this is both a comment and a question. Um, looking back, doesn't it seem like there was a little bit of like labeling on the can when it came to Facebook in that they always, like, especially since Mark Zuckerberg talked about Ready Player One being a big influence, that gaming was always kind of like a little stepping stone that they would be happy to squash and move on from? and that going forward, it's always, like their contempt for indie gaming and their misunderstanding of the gaming community, it was something that they always kind of saw as once we get past that sort of thing. But I, I think uh, that was what we thought at first, like, oh, Facebook is buying Oculus, we're all screwed. But then at the same time, Palmer was all over Reddit saying, no, no, it's all good, like we're still, you know, we're completely separate, Mark said we have like complete autonomy. We still want to be open, right? So it was like, and Palmer was always about games. Um, so yeah, the, the, the conflict started right away. We, we didn't automatically assume that yes, games are a stepping stone to whatever Facebook mind control, uh, but, but that's, that's, that's the fight that was happening, right? And I, I, I think that, that fight was won by Facebook, but 
yeah, like games are still the stepping stone, no matter what. Like that, that's all there is right now, really. You know, like the, there's a few apps on, on the Oculus platform, but like they were they were hard won to get on the store, like virtual desktop, uh, which is like the the top selling app. Uh, but they, they had to fight to get on the store because it's still ab about games, right? I still love using my uh, VR headset for meditation and for like, there's a great eye training thing that, you know, you follow a, a UFO up and down and close and far and my eyes are exhausted. That one little app is used far more by me than playing any of the games. So I, I actually like these like little micro, um, tools that enhance or improve my life in some way. I also really love using Plex. Um, so I, can, I just, with my Go, I just fall asleep watching a movie, the like giant screen. Um, and it's quite comfortable, I must say. But those, those little apps to me are the applications that get me going into VR. Games don't really make me go into VR as much. Do you have an answer for that, Blake? Yeah, there's three things I want to say. And so first is that, um, you know, the majority of the book is about Oculus, and the majority of my interviews were with Oculus former or then current employees. But but one of the big uh, side stories in the book is about Paul Bettner and his founding of Verse, which became Playful, uh, which, as you might know, created Lucky's Tale, which was one of the launch titles for for the Rift. And um, and there was a lot of reasons why I included that. I thought the developer's perspective was really important, especially because of how Oculus was marketing it, um, and that is something that. Um, I would like to also include more of, but, um, but, but I remember Paul would always tell me, you know, he, he was really annoyed in the same way as Blair and that Oculus wasn't investing enough money in content. And then I would say, Paul, you know, you at least were one of the few developers who got money from Oculus or from Facebook. And, and he would say, no, 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 you're misunderstanding me. Um, obviously he was grateful for that, but he was talking about, you know, he would always make this comparison to the iPhone and, you know, one of the reasons I really like his story is because he was early to the iPhone with words with friends, and that's how he made his money and allowed him to do even get into VR. And so he, you know, took Facebook's promise or took, sorry, took Oculus's promise at face value, like you can get in early on VR, and he thought he could do the same thing. But he was telling me that the reason, one of the main reasons that the iPhone was successful was because of all the small little apps that came with it, um, whether it was the calculator, contacts, and all that stuff. And, and that just reminds me of what you're saying, where you know, it's these micro apps that are not the reason you're probably gonna buy it, but it's what you're actually using that will get you into these other things. And I think that's one area that I would like to see um, both Facebook and Valve or anyone really do a better job with. And, uh, you know, I don't necessarily need a three-dimensional calculator, but just these things that are mini games or mini things to do, and maybe it's how you get your news, your fake news, whatever the case may be. Um, the other thing too is, um, I, I've asked Palmer, uh, you know, a few, every few months as I hear things going well at his new company and, and sort of seeing him happy, I see him happier probably than he was during the time when he was still at Oculus, uh, you know, even, or I see him less stressed, he's very busy, but he had, but he, but he's not finding, fighting these internal battles. And I said, you know, are you happier now that you're not at Oculus? Like you seem happier to me. Um, do you, you know, do you wish you were still there? And his answer has usually been something like, "It depends on how much uh, how how, um, how much input I would have had. You know, if, even if his voice, you know, if it was like 100 percent or 50 percent in the early days, if his voice was down to 10 percent, if he still felt that he could affect change and fight for the user, fight for the gamer, he would still want to be there, even if it was not as you know uh, satisfying as as where he is now." Um, and so I think that all, I think the answer probably would have been he, his his voice would have been way down because we see the direction that Facebook has been going. The last thing I want to end on, and um, this is not in the book because it didn't really fit narratively, but my last visit to Facebook was in February of 2018. I uh, and during that trip, this was before where they cut off their access to me. I had meetings, I had interviews with Hugo Barra and with Andrew Bosworth, and you know Hugo was the head of um, Oculus at the time, and Bosworth. Who, is, who used to be Mark's TA in college and has been with Facebook since almost the beginning, is now the head of AR and VR. And there's two things that they both said that were so similar that really struck me. One was that I was talking to Hugo about like sort of like, where do you see us in the point of VR history and like, what is your goal here? And, and he uh, you know, leaned on his previous experience with Android at, at, um, 
and and how he had he had you know he had joined the Android team and helped um, raise the user base from 20 million to uh, a few to over a billion, and and sort of made the comparison of like. But then anyway, when I was talking to Andrew Bosworth, he made the comparison to the point of Facebook where they had conquered college campuses and we're now taking a mainstream. And so they both have this idea of like, we've conquered gaming and now we're taking it mainstream. And I just thought to myself, that's crazy because you guys have not conquered gaming at all. You haven't, you know, successfully planted this flag that you think you have, but I believe that they think that they have and, and are sort of moving on to this next thing. And then Again, it just reminds me of what Alex Howland said about not understanding this market that they bought into. Unfortunately, they have the resources and money to make up for these errors. But I find it worrying that that they are not having the kinds of conversations like we've been having today, which should just seem like a typical Tuesday. You know, it's the kind of just part of the business. So, um, I, and I also think that the the reason why is, is arrogance. I think that um, you know. It's, it's interesting because in the social network movie, um, which of course is uh, you know an adaptation based on true stories, so we don't know exactly which parts are true and which are not, but I believe that it was true in the Accidental Billionaire's book that it's based on, that um, one of the things that I really admired about the Mark Zuckerberg character was that Eduardo kept saying, we need to do this, you know, the advertisers want us to do this, the VCs want us to do this, and Mark's response was, no, we don't even know what this thing is yet. Like, we have to let it grow organically. And I feel like listening to Andrew Bosworth tell me that they've conquered gaming and now need to take this mainstream, it just reminded me of those early conversations at Facebook. And it would have been like if, if Facebook had gone to five campuses back in 2004 and someone said, all right, you guys have conquered co college, now let's take this mainstream. I don't think it ever would have worked. Um, I think that it had to grow that really strong user base on colleges and have that as a backup and have that as you know, power to users before taking it mainstream. And so that's the part I find most worrying is that Facebook um, either doesn't seem to think that they need that or doesn't really seem to realize that they're missing that. Um, and I think that that's also what those of us that are towards the beginning, and Blair was in on this earlier than I, like that's what we miss was this, this strong community, so strong opinionated community. But, but it, it was the type of people who weren't just gonna um, play something where we're going to show 10 different people. And that's so, the enthusiasm that you I think actually that spread it. Yeah. Thank you. So, I mean, I, I got to cut us off, um, but I think that that's the key point that I really um, agree about is that the community part cannot be overestimated. Um, um, th that part of it, that Blair being at those early meetups at Facebook and at Oculus Connect and everything, and those guys being buddies and sharing their ideas and their and their methods and everything else was one of the core things that led to some of the big successes early on. And if you eradicate that, um, you're missing a really important part of the puzzle. So uh, Blake, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, I hope that you breathe a little easier that we at least got to have this chat. Um, people are gonna be able to pick up your book, I think, outside, and um, we'll follow up with you uh, in a few months. Thanks so much. Uh, please, if you have any questions, you know where to find me online. Just Google me or whatever. Um, and I usually make time to speak to anyone else. I actually make time to answer any questions for people there because um, I still feel terrible and very stupid for not making it. But thanks so much, Karim. And thank you, Blair. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, thanks so much. Take care. <laughs>